Good morning and welcome back once more to OTC 2023's Energy Insights. I'm Ed Hyland. Thanks once again for joining us. And we're going to kick things off this morning uh, with a very interesting discussion, I hope, with Laurent Pagnon, Senior VP for Subsea Product Marketing and Strategy, Technique FMP. Welcome, Laurent. Uh, introduce yourself just a little bit to us and tell us uh, more about yourself. Thank you, Ed. Yes, um, my name is uh, Laurent Pagnon. Uh, as you'll get from my accent, I'm French. And uh, I've been in Houston since 2019, living here with my family and the three kids. And I'm, uh, you know, uh, heading product marketing and strategy for the subsea business of Technip FMC. Give us a little bit uh, more about uh, Technip FMC, what it's all about, uh, sort of uh, uh, its genesis as well. Yeah. So Technip FMC has a you know, long history of delivering uh, technologies and, you know, supplying uh, innovative solutions to the offshore and onshore energy industry. More recently, we are really pushing to have integrated projects, integrated products and services for, for our clients. And, you know, with the energy landscape change as well, we are really leveraging our capabilities and competencies to supply as well on the new energy space, not just, you know, the traditional offshore and onshore uh, energy space. That's critical. That is the buzz here at OTC is new energy. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, Technique, uh, FMC, uh, transforming the future, if you will. And it's transformed the future of subsea by delivering those innovative solutions you alluded to, including the project execution model, IEPCI. Now, can you yeah. tell us a little more about that? Yeah, with pleasure. So, you know, looking back a little bit at the industry from you know, 2010 to 2014, we had high oil prices, but we had low break even for our clients in terms of field development. Profitability was not there and everybody knew it was not sustainable to continue as an industry like that. Oil price crashed a bit, but essentially Technip FMC uh, started its journey to change the market. And IEPCI is one of the companies that I'll talk a little bit about today. There is Subsi 2.0 as well, which is essentially defining a simpler product, more standard, less you know, specific to part numbers, uh, that is really bringing to our clients better economics. And when you know, Technip and FMC merged together in 2017, this is when we introduced IEPCI, which is essentially having a, the, a single roof in a single company, the total subsea field development, which means for our clients, less interface, less risk to manage, and a single company that can deliver the full subsea field. So, you know, essentially for, for us, when we were looking at this industry, we we're like, we need to be simpler, we need to have less interface, we need to be more standard, and that's why, you know, 2.0, subsea 2.0 and IEPCI are really core, core value that we deliver to our customers today. Let's talk more about Subsea 2.0, but first I want to talk about uh, CTO. Uh, you basically have a configured to order model as well. Uh, you've made that introduction possible. So wh why did you move to the CTO model? Yeah, uh, good, good question. And, uh, and I would clarify just a little bit for the audience, you know, what is 2.0, what is CTO, not to get them confused, but what we call Subsea 2.0 is the, the product itself. It means it's a new type of product, again, with less parts number, simplified design and so on. But CTO, which we call configure to order, is essentially, if you want, the operating model and system to deliver our product, our 2.0 product. So that's, you know, the difference. What is, you know, happening and changing is that our clients were very much in what we call an ETO, engineer to order model. Each of them were engineering their own products, own design, own specification. And we want to change for the CTO model, which is configure to order, meaning we have standard configuration clients can choose, so they are still have some specific configuration, but the whole process of producing our products is standardized through this operating system that we call CTO. That's what CTO is. Okay, so you have evolved from ETO to CTO. Exactly. Basically. All right, we'll talk a little bit about uh, moving to it. And uh, uh, we talk a lot about uh, standardization uh, from the company, especially around Subsea 2.0. Uh, what basically is uh, the relationship? You've explained some mm -hmm. of that as well. So we want to get into the, the subset, if you will, and Subsea mm -hmm. orders over the, the next few years. Tell us a little bit more about yeah. the growth, I guess, uh, yeah. of, of the product. Yeah, so something that is you know really important for us is creating value for a client through this offering. It's not just for, you know, Technip FMC's sake. It's, you know, a change we want to drive in the industry because we realized as it's unsustainable, we need more throughput, we need more predictability, and we, mean to, we have to deliver, you know, faster. So decrease lead time, essentially. 
So there is a very important relationship between 2.0 and CTO because one without the other makes you know little sense. It's good to have maybe a simpler, lighter, better product, but if your supply chain, for instance, is not involved in it when you supply your components for it, your manufacturing footprint is not done for it, your installation constructability is not as well thought in terms of that, it, it doesn't matter that you have a great product. But that's why, you know, CTO and 2.0 relationship is, is very important. And, I'll, you know, I'll give you an example for our clients, you know, on, on what it could mean for them. Uh, we were working with a client on a 2.0 field development. And the client at some point realized we have to delay this development and move forward another field. That was also 2.0. They could do it because we could change the orders for the other field and match our client speed and our client uh, objectives. In the traditional world of you know, ETO, when you have 24 months to 30 months to deliver our equipment and product, that would have never happened. So again, this uh, CTO model that is encompassing from commercial tendering activities and engineering, supply chain, manufacturing and then offshore installation is absolutely critical to deliver this value to the client, which is shorter lead time, more predictability and flexibility to our clients as well. It, it, it sounds, uh, you, you've given us a good example of how important collaboration is with the clients and you must have that open line of communication to be able to be nimble enough to change as the client's needs change, correct? Yeah, correct. And you are absolutely describing configurability. You have to be able to configure standard products and that requires collaboration with our clients. Why? Because previously for each project, we were designing a different product because each client for all of their projects had different specification, different type of oil and gas that remains, but they were really in a mindset that we're going to tailor the production for a specific field and a specific project. And so from a mindset perspective, that's a complete change for us and our clients. So we couldn't have done it without our clients because it's a philosophical really change. So we were very open with our clients proposing this solution. And as well to, to you know, give you a concrete example of, of our open-mindedness, we accepted our client's request sometimes to change the standard because they had very valid points. So CTO is not a rigid kind of you know, process. It's as well accepting changes. But the main difference is it's not a change specific for a project or for a client. It's a change that's going to be open and available to all the other clients. So you know, the collaboration has been a key aspect of being successful in 2.0 in CTO because without it, there would be no CTO without our clients. So it's a very valid point. Uh, talk a little bit more, if you would, about collaboration. We see a lot of it in this industry uh, as uh, uh, corporations, companies join forces uh, out of necessity uh, sometimes. Uh, Technique F uh, FM, excuse me, Technique FMC uh, included. So some of the solutions that your company is focused on, can you get more specific on that? Uh, yeah, obviously. So coming to that, and you know, this, this collaboration aspect, uh, I wanted to highlight something as well for our suppliers and the supply chain, because again, we are talking about an ecosystem here. It's not just us, it's not just the client, it's as well the suppliers. And when you look at this operating model that is CTO, what, give, what are the benefits for our suppliers? Well, they get in advance more standard part numbers, you know, equipment and things we supply from them. And from this perspective, they were always like juggling with all these orders and parts numbers from Technip FMC from all over the world that were different. And that's why they were asking us, I need 12 months, I need 18 months to deliver what you need because again, it's different. So I need to change my manufacturing setup so I can supply Technip FMC with what you need. Now that you are moving on, because we have this tight relationship with a selected pool of suppliers that are working with us, they know in advance the standard things we're going to ask for them. So for our suppliers as well, it means, again, we are much more predictable as Technip FMC. It's not just for our clients. And we are able to drive this efficiency and collaboration throughout the industry, not just between us and our clients. It's, you know, 
Really, it's an ecosystem we are building and everybody is gaining from this ecosystem from more throughput, more predictability, and then accelerating time to first production, which is a client, I would say, grail or end game, which yeah. is if I could deliver this field, you know, six months or a year in advance, that I would have a massive, you know, return uh, for, for our clients. So this collaboration, it's an example with our suppliers. We open the books, we are very open with them. They know in advance, it's standard, and we get a great amount of efficiency out of the supply chain thanks to this collaboration. Key word, efficiency, very good, yeah. okay. We want to talk a little bit about carbon transportation and storage uh, is a quickly emerging uh, aspect. Uh, can you expand on the greenhouse gas and CO2 transportation and storage aspect? Yeah, yeah so jumping on, I would say, energy transition globally, um, you know, what Technip FMC is trying to achieve here essentially is to be really perceived as we are an energy architect overall in the energy industry, is to, um, I would say, transpose what we know in subsea, what we know in a surface business into the energy transition space. We're not going to build from scratch, you know, a new leg and a new business because we believe as we have so much experience on offshore energy, we can use this experience, this capability that we have, you know, in engineering with our supply chain typically to, to supply, you know, on the offshore renewable, with our manufacturing footprint. We believe we can use that smartly to deliver on the energy transition, you know, space. So we have three pillars. It's, you know, it's fairly simple. And you were asking about the first pillar, which is, and I will, I'll come back to it, which is greenhouse gas removal. And here we talk about safely, reliably and efficiently gather, transport, inject CO2 uh, uh, in, our, in, in, in our fields. The second pillar is offshore renewable. Here, we believe as Technip FMC, we have, you know, we are the best at subsea, underwater. And so we think when you look at offshore renewable, a lot about the seabed, your foundation, mooring lines, dynamic power cable, uh, floating structures, all this knowledge exists already in the offshore energy. So we think we can use that to deliver offshore renewable. And our, and our third, I would say, pillar of our energy transition strategy is around hydrogen. Because we think if we look a little bit ahead in the future, hydrogen is going to be needed and necessary to store energy. And there is no better place to do that than subsea. Because I'm, uh, maybe I will explain a little bit after that, but I'm passionate about why it makes sense to talk about hydrogen offshore and subsea. So looking at um, um, the integrated carbon transportation storage solution we are developing, essentially, if you look at uh, a CCUS, so, um, uh, you know, carbon, uh, carbon and utilization storage system, you have the emitter of CO2 and you need to capture it. That's not our scope. We don't capture the CO2. Our scope starts when you gather the CO2, you need to treat the CO2 because sometimes you have to compress it. You have to remove a little bit of water, a little bit of certain things. So we have all this equipment that are necessary to do so. And then you need to transport it. Sometimes quite a distance from the emitter source to the injection site. And our scope goes up to the injection well because we can supply as well again our wellheads, our trees, whether offshore or onshore, to inject the CO2. So Technip FMC value proposition is suivant is, hey, Mr. You know, uh, Total Energy, Talos, our partner in it, or you know, whoever, we can provide you a system that is complete from the gathering station up to the injection point. That's what we do by leveraging what already exists in the energy industry. So are you able to, I'm going a bit off track here, but I wanted to ask about yeah. gathering the data from the operators and utilizing that on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is data that sometimes changes on a day-to-day -day yeah. basis. Mm -hmm how adaptable and nimble can you be with those needs? Can you meet yeah. them on a, on a timely scale to make sure the client does perhaps save money or perhaps doesn't make a mistake? Yeah. Uh, look, it's, it's a very good question. And uh, maybe I'll use a tangible example Please. of a certain data that is super important, I would say, for CCUS. That is essentially, how do we know CO2 is not leaking? And what we have to do here is actually measure through sensors the CO2 injection rate 
and then measure if there is any gas leak coming from either the well or the reservoir. But then you need an integrated control system, smart, that is able to make decisions based on all these data and sensors. So it's typically one type of data that is absolutely critical for our clients because I can tell you when we discuss with the authorities, CO2 leakage is a massive topic on CCUS side and they want to be absolutely 100% sure there will be no leak either from the reservoir of the system or from the well. So it's typically here, we leverage Technip FMC integrated control system solutions to track from the pipeline, from the gathering facility, to the pipeline, to the well, to the reservoir, holistically CO2 tracking. And that's typically something our clients are extremely, you know, see that as extremely important because from a regulation perspective, environment perspective, and simply say HAC, it's a critical matter. So data in this aspect is fundamental. I wanted to ask about offshore, but before I yeah. do that, I, 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 another thought that occurred to me was uh, I want you to put your salesman hat on just okay. for a moment. And and can you, we, we had a discussion before the interview began about the old way of doing things and how you are able to do things in a different and more effective, efficient yeah. way. Can you can you compare and contrast? Because, yeah. because there are clients, there are people who have been doing this for many years and say, our, our way works fine. Yeah. We're, we're just fine. Why do we need to change? And so that would be the question. Why yeah. do they need to change? So it's, it's a question we, we, we debate a lot uh, at the moment. So if you look, and I, and I use the energy transition as you know, a typical example, we see a very different behaviors in this space because a lot of innovation is being required to make it happen. And if, you, if we use our deep purple hydrogen development, for instance, it's a consortium here because we knew alone we couldn't deliver you know, this complete system. So we are using partners with us. We have some clients like Repsol or Vattenfall. So we have a utility. We have a kind of oil and gas traditional company that is diversifying in energy transition. We have NEL, which is supplying more the electrolyzer of the project. We're going to have an ABB for you know, the, the, the poor equipment system. We have a Technip FMC because it's our baby, if you want, that is the integrator, overall architect, delivering the full system. And we are teaming up together. And I can tell you, when you look at the energy transition, we are not alone doing that because we are in a race against time. We want to go fast and we think we have to collaborate together. We have to put our brains together at the same time in the same moment to deliver this value. And we don't have 50 years. You know, the oil and gas traditional industry is a little bit slow because there are heavy risk when you introduce an innovation on the market. And so our clients are sometimes a little bit reluctant to go fast and deliver innovation. In the energy transition space, it's a different behavior. We don't have time. We have to go fast. And so we jointly innovate. There is more open innovation than maybe in the traditional energy space. And that's something, if we look at, uh, again, ICTS, our solution, we are teaming up with Talos Energy, with a client, together, because we felt we could be so much quicker by teaming up, taking the best of Talos, taking the best of Technip FNC, then trying us ourselves alone to convince our clients. It's another example that in this space, innovation is the key and doing it together is the rule, if you want, versus alone. Let's build on that because you mentioned yeah. Deep Purple and for those who may not be familiar, yeah. tell us about Deep Purple and uh, what technologies and collaborations are involved there. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, good question. I introduced Deep Purple. We, we haven't talked about it, but Deep Purple essentially is integrating wind or any offshore renewable source with hydrogen together. Technip FMC, you know, we believe the combination of offshore renewable and hydrogen is the winning combination because offshore wind, tidal, wave, whatever, you know, offshore renewable source, it is intermittent. And you know all the downsides and drawback that comes with intermittency. And we believe that by combining hydrogen production with this intermittent 
renewable green production source, we could come to a stable solution and stable system. Why that? If you look at wind, sometimes we're going to have peak production that are above what we need. And we're going to use, if you want this peak production, to produce hydrogen through simple electrolysis. And when there is no wind, we can use this hydrogen and turn it back to electricity. So we can have actually a system that is kind of roughly stable in terms of electricity output if we combine hydrogen, store this energy subsea, and deliver it to the end client. And that's the beauty, I would say, of Deep Purple, is combining these two energies together. If you would, in, in the closing minutes that we have, give us some, some thoughts on uh, a buzzword here at OTC 2023, or phrase, if you will, of course, is energy uh, transition. Uh, the the new uh, tr the new energy uh, that is that is coming along and and preparing for the future is yeah. another way of putting it I guess but if if you would talk about how you are positioned to move forward and as your clients perhaps are a part of this transition you and your company can also be a part of it yeah so look I would say you know energy transition is not even a buzzword anymore because it's already happening yeah I mean you know we're looking. Europe is now producing more power, you know, through renewable sources than any other sources. So, you know, this transition is ongoing, happening already. It's not new anymore. I think you've seen the shift from all our clients in terms of investment. So Technip FMC, we, has, we are fully on board, you know, on this journey. Um, I think what we want actually to do is continue this Technip FMC culture of driving innovation, technologies, in this space together with our clients because we think we could be if you want a catalyst or we could accelerate the offshore renewable market because today the maturity of floating offshore wind floating tidal and other elements is not yet there compared to onshore solar or onshore wind for instance what's lacking what's lacking is companies that step up to industrialize and make it efficient and reliable and when you look at what we have in front of us is lots of, you know, dynamic interarray power cable that we are developing. It's foundation. It's a complete system that is under the sea that we think company like us could really accelerate in the, in the coming months and years. So again, Technip FMC position is pursue and continue our technology leadership and mindset to support our clients to accelerate their offshore renewable transition that is happening at the moment. So it looks like you're positioning for the future. I mean, we're looking at uh, a company, we talk about energy transition, but you're looking, you must have to look 10, 15, 20 years down the road to be able to uh, presume and uh, associate with what the companies are going, where they are going to be at that time frame. So you have to be ahead of that curve. That's correct. So, you know, if we look at the three pillars, greenhouse gas removal, floating renewable and, and hydrogen, I'd say the first one to come to market is definitely greenhouse gas removal in CCUS. We have this partnership with Talos. We are working on different projects with them. So I'd say this is a little bit more mature than maybe the first market that's going to materialize for us. The others, as you say, we already have, you know, some success, some position with our partners. But, but you are right in a sense, we are really looking a little bit ahead in the future. If we look at the uh, hydrogen portion of it, we are at the moment in pilot phase, demonstrating the technologies in one of our sites with this ecosystem of partners with us together. Uh, and by end of the year, we would have, I would say, concluded this pilot. But the next stage is then an offshore real demonstration in pilot. So if you think about it, it's not for next year that we can really sell and leverage that. We are trying to position this, you know, ecosystem of partners and ourselves, as you said, for the next five to 10 years to be there when our clients would have, you know, scaling and accelerating with hydrogen, but not today. We will look forward to the demos so we can all see yes. a little bit of a glimpse as to what the future is with Technip FMC. Would be a pleasure to invite you to our site in Norway and, and, and look at the pilot. Would and I great. would take that invitation in a heartbeat. Yeah. I appreciate your time so much, Laurent. And thank you also for joining us here on Energy Insights. We will have much more throughout the day here at OTC 2023. I'm your host, Ed Hyland. Thanks for joining us.